What is that? What? What's that smell? The cologne? No. Opportunity. No, money. Okay. You smell money. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Books and Beers. So it's been a long day, and it's probably gonna be a long night because it looks like I'm gonna have to be working after filming this video. So we're gonna do things a little different, and I'm actually gonna get started on the beer right now. Cheers. So the book I'm gonna be reviewing today is called How to Buy Your First Home. Not super well known, but it was one that I really liked because it was the first real estate book I've ever read. So I wanna give you guys a pro tip. So I actually grew up watching this book in my dad's nightstand because my dad actually purchased it in the early 2000s. A tip from my father, who I'm gonna put a picture of right here, who actually owns the book, is whenever you wanna purchase a book on a certain topic, but you're not sure about what book to buy, the best thing you can do is go to a Barnes & Noble, go to any bookstore that you have in your city, and then go and sit down in that area, grab the three that interest you the most, sit down and skim through them, and then find the right pick. That's what my father did when he purchased this book. He actually went, sat down, and spent a few hours in Barnes & Noble, and came up with this one being the best purchase. Now, with that being said, I actually hope to have my dad as a guest in another episode. I really like reading the books that he already read, and we talk about reading all the time, which is one of the things that I love about reading. But to do a review very quickly of the book, I did like it. I liked it, like I said, because my father read it and it had all his annotations. The author makes a really, really good case of explaining every single topic that it has to do when you're buying a house. And it gets down to the very, very small details, which I love. The thing that I didn't like, and it's bad for me to judge it this way, is that it's a book that was reading, it's a book that was written in 2003. So obviously, if you're looking for a book about real estate, like I had a friend text me a few days ago asking me if I knew any books about real estate, I said, this is a good one, but it's a little outdated. With that being said, let's get to the top five mortgages that I wanna to explain to you guys. Oh, and as far as the connection, this book is about buying houses, and I really hope I can buy a house in Miami, where I live. So, this is a beer from Miami, Vesa Sur, and specifically is the one that has mango. So, we'll get to that. So, to be completely honest with you guys, I actually sat down and started explaining the five different mortgages, and I realized that no one was going to be interested in that. So, I'm going to shift and do things a little different. I'm going to explain the main two type of mortgages, which are very basic, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect it to one of my favorite movies, which is The Big Short. Actually, let me rephrase that, my favorite movie. And the reason why I am connecting it to the video today is because it is really hard nowadays to talk about mortgages and the mortgage market without talking about the 2008 crisis. More than the movie, I'm actually gonna focus it in one of my favorite scenes that exist in movies, which is a scene where the character that Ryan Gosling portrays walks into this hedge fund, which the character that Steve Carell portrays is the manager of, and he walks up with the idea of shorting the housing market, which means that you're betting that the housing market was gonna crash. I can by no means explain what it is today because it's gonna take a lot more preparation, a lot more books, but I can break it down and tell you guys how this scene applied to that. So there are basically two types of mortgages that we're gonna be talking about today. The first one is fixed rate, and the second one is adjustable rate. A brief parenthesis is what is a mortgage? A mortgage is a loan where you hold a house as collateral. What that means is that you go to a bank and you say, hey bank, give me some money that I'm gonna repay you. And if I don't repay you that money, you can take my house. Simple as that. For that loan, a lot of things apply. When you go to the bank and you ask for mortgage, you're gonna see a few things like your credit score, credit card history, like how long you had a credit card, how much debt do you have, if you have any college debt, how much money you're making, and things like that. Based on all those factors, you're gonna get a certain rate. Obviously, the lower the rate, the better, because it means that you're gonna be paying less interest. When you have a fixed rate mortgage, what it means, just like the name says, is that the bank is gonna give you a set interest amount that you're going to pay over the duration of that mortgage most of the time either 15 years or 30 years the second type of mortgage and here is where it gets interesting is an adjustable rate mortgage also called an arm adjustable rate means that for the first few months 
of that mortgage, you're going to be paying the exact same interest. That interest is probably going to be very low, which is going to be very appealing for you. But then after an X amount of months, I don't know exactly how many they are. I think it depends on the type of mortgage. The rate that you're paying of interest is going to be pegged to a certain index. That index can be many different ones. I'm going to put a few of them right here. The example I'm going to use is going to be LIBOR. But what that means is that every single month, depending on that rate, you're going to pay a certain interest rate on your mortgage. There's obviously caps that say, let's say that LIBOR goes to 25%. You're not going to pay, you're not going to pay so much. But a lot of times those caps are in the percentage that the rate can increase every single year. So if you take out a 30 year mortgage, what can probably happen is that every single year it can increase by 1%, 1%, 1%. That compounds a lot. You can go and watch a video of the compound interest and see what that means. So how does that apply to the 2008 crisis and how does it apply to the scene that I told you guys? Well, what happened was that in the early 2000s, more and more people started applying for mortgages and people have been doing this for decades and everything was going fine what happened was that the standards of who were getting mortgages started going lower and lower and lower people that didn't have the credit scores people that didn't have the income or the jobs or the credit history were getting these mortgages and more importantly they were getting adjustable rate mortgages so what happened was that at the beginning everyone was being able to pay their mortgages because like i said with an adjustable rate mortgage at the beginning interest rates are really low. There's a starting point where those adjustable rates started hitting. And as they started increasing, people started to not being able to pay it. I want to play a really small part of the scene right now. No income verification. Adjustable rates. Dog. The default rates are already up from 1% to 4%, fellas. And if they rise to 8%, and they will, a lot of these triple Bs are going to zero too. And that, you're too close, is an opportunity. Okay, you're saying that at 8%, the bonds fail and we are already at 4%? That's right. If they go to eight, it's Armageddon. Yeah, that's right. How come nobody's talking about this? So when they say that the rates are gonna go from four to 8%, it didn't mean that the adjustable rate that people were paying in their mortgages was gonna go from four to 8%. That was just the amount of people that were actually defaulting, meaning that they couldn't pay their mortgage, so the banks were actually getting all these houses. However, it is a good way of seeing how, since the adjustable rates were being implemented, people started defaulting. And that's basically what happened. As more and more adjustable rates started hitting, as many more people starting to have to pay rates that were pegged to indexes like the LIBOR, more people started defaulting. This caused what was called the housing bubble to pop. And all these houses started going in foreclosures and you guys have probably seen the pictures. And that's what actually caused all the prices of the houses to be really cheap around 2009, 2010. And that in a summary was basically the root cause of the 2008 crisis. Obviously, if you get into any movies or documentaries, you might start seeing how Bush came to play or how Obama came to play or how the Fed chairmans came to play. In my opinion, however, the important thing wasn't when it came to politicians. At the end of the day, most books and most reports say that the politicians didn't really know what was happening. It came down to people and it came down to the banks and it came down to a market that was not being regulated that just started snowballing into something really, really bad, which by the time that they realized it was a snowball, it was already too late to capture. I know this explanation might not have been the best one, but one thing that I wanted to do when we're probably gonna start doing in our videos is speaking small topics and trying to connect it to another big topic and just explain that. The 2008 crisis is something that I really, really like, and I really like reading and understanding more. So I'm probably going to have a few follow up videos where I'm going to talk about it and hopefully explain it more. As far as the book, one thing is that the book was reading before the 2008 crisis, which obviously was a huge deal because any book about real estate probably talks about that because it was really important. So with that being said, I'm actually going to give the book a 3.9. The things that it says about what you should do when you're buying a house are really important but it's a little outdated and the author never came with a newer version that's why i'm actually going to give it also a read and the beer it's also a 3.9 the issue with the beer is that it has mango which i love but it just gives it a little taste of like the cheap alcohol that you used to drink in college with like very cheap orange juice which i don't mind it but that's just a connection that i don't love in the beer 
kind of a different video. I wanted to make it short, but probably went a little bit on the longer end. But I really hope you guys liked it. And as always, remember to subscribe because we have videos every single Wednesday. Thank you guys so much. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.